Hare Krishna. So, when I was corresponding with Antadhi Prabhu about this class, he mentioned it will be a common Brahmachari class. So, the first thought that came in my mind is that it's an uncommon Brahmachari class. <laughs> Why uncommon? Usually, when I, I just listed five months, I was abroad. So, probably when I'm traveling, I give 10 classes in a week. So, in a month I gave over 40 classes, in 5 months about 200 classes. With those 200 classes, I didn't give a single Brahmachari class. Because <laughs> there are practically no Brahmachari ashrams in the West. So, first time when I went abroad, I said that, you know, I'm from, I'm from Pune, Mumbai, where there are about 150 Brahmacharis. So, one day told me in all of America, there are not 150 Brahmacharis. <laughs> so, it's uncommon. And today I will speak on the topic of overcoming discouragement in spiritual life. So, I will speak this in three parts and after each part we can have some questions. And so, the overall theme will be that we need to center our spiritual life on Krishna. And I will talk about how we can have different centers. Then I'll talk about how storms can come in our lives based on whichever center we are in. And then how we can find an anchor for ourselves. Actually, is this tied? Can it come closer? If possible, I can just, without standing up, I can write. So, thank you. Wait a minute, wait, sorry, that's okay. No problem. It's visible for you there? So, sorry, okay. So basically, these are <coughs> okay, social. Philosophical. Mm. So basically, Broadly speaking, <coughs> when we connect with, when we come to Krishna and start practicing bhakti, there are multiple factors which may inspire us to come towards Him. So now, this is not necessarily exhaustive categorization, it's more of an indicative categorization. So, I'll just explain each of these categorizations. Say, for example, social means that we all have a social need for belonging. We all want to feel accepted, valued, respected. And if we come in a spiritual community and we feel a sense of uh, acceptance, then, oh, I want, to, I want to be a part of this. In fact, one of the main reasons in the Western and Westernized world, when people turn towards spirituality, it is primarily because they want a sense of community. So here we feel, oh, devotees are so good, so kind, they are so caring. Hmm. Basically, we are with good people. That we may come because of social reasons. So philosophical is where uh, somebody has serious philosophical questions and then they get answers to that. And that's what brings me to Krishna. So that, that could be one way in which you come to Krishna. Then cultural could be, I've seen this especially in the Western world, that many people, they, many Indians, when they go to America, maybe initially they are very, they are interested in just earning a lot of money and maybe enjoying themselves. But once they get married and have children, then they feel, oh, we want our children to have some Indian culture. And then they start exploring Indian culture. Like about these people who are born in, uh, who are born as children to, to Indian families who immigrated there, there is an acronym called ABCD. ABCD is American Born Confused Deshis. 
<laughs> so they they because their whole culture is around them is american they are going to school they are american they would like to be american but they have decline because they are, first of all their skin is brown they are not white skin so in some ways one devotee was telling me that this these people are like coconuts brown from outside white from inside <laughs> so so many um, parents when they when they become parents that's when they feel oh we want to pass on this culture and we are what is this culture they, they, they because they may have followed it because their parents followed it but their children are going to follow like their children are going to ask questions <coughs> so that the cultural pathway when somebody might come to krishna because of that how oh, this is our culture, our culture i want to follow it more how can i follow it more mm-hmm. and then there could be psychological this is happening a lot in the western world where um, people are very much troubled now social and psychological not entirely different social is where people are lonely and psychological can also be loneliness but it's more of depression people have mental issues mental health issues <coughs> i was a part of a uh, interfaith discussion on a topic mm, it is a type topic of the type is a title was so the title of the topic was why hasn't god died till now <laughs> <laughs> now what that meant was that uh, since about well, more than a century and a half more, uh, more at least more than a century uh, sociologists starting from some you know if you may have heard of frederick nietzsche who had said god is dead so the idea was that they felt that god, the idea of god has become irrelevant now and now when nietzsche said that god is dead he did not say that in a celebratory sense he said that because of science and rationality and progress faith in the conception of god that was there at that time the biblical god that has become untenable and therefore he said we are the greatest of murderers and the whole ocean will not be able to wash the stain of our hands because of this murder of the highest of all beings uh, it was a, it is a lamentable event but he basically said you can't believe in god now so but the point is that although sociologists are saying that god is dead but religion all over the world it has remarkable staying power Now, America is at least among the western world one of the most religious countries Europe is quite atheistic America is quite religious there are certain belts which are called bible belts which are full of uh, quite uh, evangelical christians then the middle east of course is quite religious india is religious russia is becoming rapidly religious after the fall of ussr although china is still controlled but china also christianity is growing i was at a pastor i was at a interfaith meeting so a pastor from china he was telling that they have these churches and on sundays they have eight services and they have to beg people please don't come for more than one service because other people should be allowed to come so of course not everywhere but my point is that religion has remarkable staying power and for many sociologists it's a mystery why so there was a new york times article which said that you know how mainstream christianity has rebranded god rebranded god means that earlier say for example there's a famous prayer in uh, <coughs> in christianity that oh father thou art in heaven give us hallowed be thy name give us our daily bread now that envisions god as a cosmic supplier that image has become mostly irrelevant for people in the western world because nobody worries about bread over there if they worry they worry about butter for their bread <laughs> <laughs> not for bread <laughs> so the idea of god as a cosmic supplier is not so relevant so now many churches present god not as a cosmic supplier but as a cosmic therapist that you come to god and your your depression will go away your mental health issues will go away so basically a lot of people come 
to start exploring something spiritual because they have some psychological issues. So broadly speaking, we can say these are different ways in which you can see people come toward Krishna. So uh, now you could correlate this broadly with 716 in the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna says four kinds of people come to him. Those who are distressed, those who are distressed, those who are distressed, and those who are distressed. <laughs> Ultimately, even if somebody is inquisitive, now why will they inquire about something beyond the material? It's only beyond, they are somehow dissatisfied with the material. So for all of us, so we all start connecting with Krishna because of one of these paths. Now it may be more than one, but there is one primarily. And I want to say it's only one. This is, as I said, in start, this is indicative. This is not necessarily exhaustive, but broadly speaking. Mm, so some of us, I, I primarily came because of the philosophical path. Now I had questions and uh, I, I mean, the way devotees answered my questions, it was amazing. I was once traveling with Radha Prabhu to Mumbai and then I asked Prabhu, can I ask you some questions? And he said, sure. And he probably thought I will have one, two questions. I had like 11 full scape pages <laughs> filled with questions from top to bottom. <laughs> so he was very patiently answering all my questions. <laughs> so, so now this is the path that brought me. But now what happens, see the there are many things for us which help us to get the shelter of Krishna. But the problem is that what helps us get the shelter of Krishna can also become our shelter instead of Krishna. That means philosophy should help us to take shelter of Krishna, but we may take shelter of philosophy itself. So devotee association should help us to take shelter of Krishna but if we depend only on devotee association and sometimes it may happen that the very thing that gives us shelter might take away our might actually the thing which brings us to Krishna may block us on our way to Krishna why? Now, about maybe 10 years after I started practicing bhakti or 10-12 years now I started getting certain questions and I found that I couldn't get satisfactory answers for those questions and I became very disturbed by that. And then I was asking other devotees and nobody was able to answer. And what happened is that, so I couldn't understand, say if, if I had a particular question and when I couldn't get the answer, I was very disturbed by it. And then I had asked other people the questions and I was disturbed because they were not disturbed. <laughs> <laughs> now why does this question trouble you? It's such a perplexing question. But, you know, so now after many years I realize their shelter was not philosophy. So, okay, some questions, there are so many questions. If you don't get an answer, what is the big deal? Just stand there and be happy. <laughs> so, so, generally speaking, you know, we take shelter of Krishna through one of these paths. And it's good that we have some way we take shelter of Krishna. But sometimes we make our base primarily here itself. If not primarily, exclusively here itself. So for example, if we start practicing bhakti because we feel, oh, devotees are so nice. And then, sooner or later we will meet devotees who are not nice. <laughs> then what do you do? <laughs> So we see this, the social aspect most drastically, say in the example of Draupadi. Draupadi had five husbands, five protectors. And in the normal course of life, she was practicing dharma and taking shelter of Krishna with her husbands. But life brought her to a situation where she was helpless and her husbands couldn't help her. So what does she do at that time? Either she 
he can, can keep, you know, why are you not helping me? Why are you not helping me? Why are you not helping me? She could be cursing them, she could be blaming them. But at that time, she did not do that. She, she this was her path, but she did not stay over here. When there was a quake over there, when there was a challenge over there, she moved on. She just took shelter of Krishna. So sometimes it may happen for us that even in devotee association, that we may feel very lonely. We, I gave a seminar on loneliness. Uh, I, I gave a topic overcoming loneliness. And then one devotee messaged me, just changed the title of the seminar. He said, why? He said, because if anybody says I am going to seminar on overcoming loneliness, then it is like a criticism of all their friends. <laughs> that means you have so many friends, but you are still lonely. <laughs> so, so then we changed the seminar and we said that, okay, cultivating rich relationships. <laughs> so anyway, the point is that there is Sometimes loneliness, if we are just alone, lost on an island, we might be lonely. But the worst loneliness is not when we are physically alone. The worst loneliness is when we are surrounded by people who don't understand us. If, if for, for the human heart, being understood is as important as oxygen is for the human body. Just start suffocating, you start choking. So, if we, uh, we are with devotees and somehow, say like for Draupadi it happened at that time, that none of her husbands could help her. So, at that time she took shelter of Krishna. So, when this storm occurred for her, so she, so the same husband, so at that time her husbands could not help her so she went on in spite of that. So whatever gives us, or what you could say, whatever gives us shelter of Krishna, we may have to give that up to take shelter of Krishna. So coming back to this point again, philosophical. You know, I read. So I've, I met many devotees, and I interacted with. Over a period of time, I interacted with intellectual devotees across the world. And then I found that devotees far more senior than me, maybe devotees who are even spiritual masters in our movement, they also have the questions that I have. And they are honestly figuring out the best answers to those questions. And I realized that I was not alone in having doubts. And they told me that they don't speak about these doubts to anyone because you know, these are not the doubts that everybody gets. So basically, what happened, at least for me, what happened at that time was the way I was able to go through this was by finding like-minded association. So that means sometimes we might not be able to go directly from here to Krishna. Then if this path is getting blocked, then you might have to find some other path to go toward Krishna. So, the Draupadi, had, so now another example could be say um, psychological. Sometimes we we practice bhakti because we want to feel peaceful. But then, when we start taking up services and responsibilities, you know, those responsibilities take away our peace. You say, oh, I have to get this done, I have to get that done, I have to get that done. Uh, when I travel, as I said, if I, if I travel for 2-3 months, I have to travel across the world, it's, if I am going to speak for about 100 hours, the planning takes 50 hours. So, you know, go to this place and how to, where to, uh, what kind of programs to do. It takes a lot of time and probably, you know, any kind of organized preaching. I'm not a very organized person. Maybe that's what it takes more time for me. I don't know. But the point is that I don't like this. But, that it, it needs to be done to get to what we want to do, what we like to do. So, for all of us, if, if I think that, oh, I, if we think that, I enjoy doing this, Bhakti makes me feel so good. But sometimes it may not make us feel so good. <coughs> so if we are purely on the psychological level, then we will get swept away. Psychological level means you could also use the word emotional level. That I want to feel peaceful, I want to feel good, I want to feel nice. Yes, that is good. 
We want to feel that. But if that becomes our shelter, we want to come to Krishna and sometimes coming to Krishna may require fighting for Krishna. And that time there is will not feel good. So similarly with respect to cultural aspect. Cultural aspect means that there are many things we expect the culture, this, this is how things should be. And if things are not like that, we get very disturbed. And this happened to many Indians when they came to America, Vishnu Prabhupada's temples. And for them, their idea of temple was you should have a proper tower, you should have a proper chakra on top, and you should have deities in a particular direction. And when they would come to the temples, and they would not see any of this, what kind of temple is this? So that disturbed them very much. And the same thing may happen to us when we are practicing bhakti. Uh, we may have certain cultural expectations of how things should be. And if things are not like that, then how do we practice bhakti? So, uh, when I first went to America, and I went to a uh, most of the programs, especially if you go to Western outreach programs, I was at a yoga studio, and in that yoga studio, not a yoga studio, it was a yoga festival. There are 300 people over there, and I, along with the two devotees, are taken, we were the only three Indians. And maybe like in that yoga festival, it was complete Western people, and you know, they initially, I didn't feel anything spiritual about them. It was all. Generally, our conception of yoga is that it's something just for the body. But as I slowly started talking with them, I saw that they were thoughtful people. And gradually, uh, although they might seem to be very body conscious, but it is their body consciousness that is opening them to spiritual consciousness. Because what is happening? Something from the Eastern world is helping their body to improve. And they feel maybe the Eastern world has something more to offer. So when we say that, when I go to yoga school, I say, we are not going to speak about yoga, I am going to speak about yoga wisdom. And people are interested in that. So, now these people are not in the least, uh, in any way, culturally, what we might think of as devotees. But they are very, very interested. So now, this, you could say, each of these are ways in which we can come to Krishna. I was in Wellington and I was in Wellington. Yeah. I was giving a class and suddenly I saw everybody was shaking. I said, what happened? I said, I myself was shaking. And they said this is an earthquake. So and they were very calm. I, now being here, earthquake will get alarmed. He says, No, earthquake occur once a week over here. <laughs> really? <laughs> but most earthquakes are like not noticeable. Sometimes you notice them, and some, some earthquakes are very high on the Richter scale, but minor tremors keep happening. So basically now, the further from you the earthquake is happening, say if the earthquake happens at the end of this room, we will observe it, but we will not get shaken by it. At least not that shaken. Say it happens right under where you are sitting, you will get very shaken. So similarly for us, in our spiritual lives, now, what disturbs us the most reveals what shelters us the most. That means, if something happens and that disturbs us very much, that indicates that is where we are sitting. That is where we are sheltered. Say, for example, in the devotee community, uh, somebody does something wrong or somebody goes away from the practice of bhakti. Somebody leaves the ashram. And some people get, now everybody will be concerned by it, but some people get extremely disturbed by it. That means that our shelter is in that social circle. Now definitely we want a social circle, but this is not just a social circle, it's a spiritual circle. We want to go toward Krishna. And in general, whatever gives us shelter can also obstruct the shelter of Krishna. So when what is happening, we have to be careful. Now normally, it's very very difficult to directly take shelter of Krishna. And we need the intermediate shelters to take shelter of Krishna. We cannot directly just center ourselves on Krishna. But we need to be aware. 
Yes. So now, if somebody feels the need of a anchoring social circle, then we need to make the arrangements to have the anchoring social circle. If I have intellectual needs, then I need to make time and search for like-minded association, where I can ask questions, others can ask questions, we can have discussions, and. I have found across the world a few people who are very, with whom we are very linked. Radha Gopinath Prabhu, Radha Gopinath Temple, Shamanand Prabhu. So, Shamanand Prabhu and I, the, we often, every two, three days we talk for half an hour, one hour on phone, which are part of the world we may be in. And we discuss almost everywhere and everything under the planet Earth. And outside the planet Earth also. <laughs> so then he gives a very creative Krishna conscious perspective to things. Sometimes I share my thoughts. And the, if somebody else were talking, say, is this Krishna consciousness? And then at the end, some Krishna conscious point will come. So the, the reason I am giving this as an example is that if I have a particular need, then maturity means to recognize that no one is obliged to fulfill my need. Maturity means to recognize that no one is obliged to fulfill my need. It's like an example, when there is a small infant and the baby starts crying and then the world runs. The mother, the father, the uh, nanny or whoever is there, they all run to pacify the child, feed the child, do whatever is required. But now the baby is hungry and the baby needs to be fed. But if an adult is hungry, and the adult starts crying. And nobody will come running to feed the adult. That doesn't mean that the adult's hunger is not as genuine a need as the infant's hunger. But being an adult means that the adult knows that the world is not obliged to fulfill my need. I have to make the I have to take the initiative. I have to provide for myself. So that means maybe go to somewhere where you can buy some food or cook some food and eat it, whatever, make some arrangement. So maturity means to recognize that no one is obliged to fulfill our needs. This doesn't mean our needs will not be fulfilled. But taking the initiative to have our needs fulfilled is for us to do. In the initial phase of our spiritual life, um, the the way we are going on, we might feel okay. Well, I'm completely contented, and that's good. We are contented, but it's like a baby's needs are different, a teenager's needs are different, and adults' needs are different. And within devotional service, whatever are our needs, it is our responsibility to get them fulfilled. So, if somebody is very much uh, into the mind, in the sense that they, they like psychology and then they like uh, to, like analysis and they want to understand things better. Then they have to find out those devotees who are interested in that kind of analysis. And then they will understand. Some devotees will chant Hare Krishna and your mind will become peaceful. Some devotees, and it works for them. For some devotees, if it is not immediately working, that doesn't mean that they are wrong, but their needs are different. So each of us has to, when Bhaktivara Thakur says, we have to find like-minded association. So one way of understanding like-minded association is that, <coughs> that association which has the same needs that we have. So if my primary need is intellectual, then like-minded association with those whose need is also intellectual. Mm -hmm. If my primary need is cultural, if somebody's primary need is cultural, that means okay, cultural can have many things. Oh, DT worship should be done in this way, kirtan should be done like this, yagya should be done like this. This prasad should be cooked like this, this should be worn like this, whatever. Then somebody else must say, okay, just do it and move on. For at one level, we can say the cooking is also a service to Krishna, and of course, it's a very important service. But different people may have different approaches. For somebody, cooking itself then gives them absorption in Krishna. They cook and they may hear some kirtan and hear some, they get absorbed. For some people, Cooking is something you do so that you can serve Krishna. And it's not wrong. Of course, whatever you cook, we will offer to Krishna and bring on. But for some people, if cooking is their service to Krishna, then they will go very deep into this. You know, you can do like this, you can do like that, you can do like that. But somebody else, look, come on, you just have to eat and move on. 
If it tastes good, that's great. Let's move. So, if somebody wants to talk a lot about cooking, you know, you can do this, you can mix this, you can do this. When are we going to talk about, about devotional service? And that is their devotional service. So basically, each one of us, when we, uh, when we have a particular shelter, then we have to, at one, so I'll summarize what I spoke, and we can have a few questions before I move to the next point. And as I said that, we need to be centered on Krishna. But we cannot directly go towards Krishna. So we might go through the social, philosophical, cultural or psychological pathways towards Krishna. And I explain each of them. So <coughs> what gives a shelter of Krishna can become an alternative shelter to Krishna. And if that starts happening, then in those situations we need to move forward and take shelter of Krishna. Directly as Viropadi did. Or we need to expand our connection and take shelter through some other channel. So, when we uh, do this, uh, if we have a particular need, say intellectual need or cultural need or psychological need, maturity means that nobody is obliged to fulfill our needs. We have to find the association, find the resources by which that need will be fulfilled and we can move forward in our practice of bhakti. Any questions or comments? Yes, Yes, So you are telling that uh, we should have like-funded association where the needs of the group is same. So uh, sometimes I feel that uh, what my nature is and somebody else's nature is somewhat different. So there is also attraction, like you say, unlike whole attraction. So we feel sometimes really in the self association of people who have a different perspective also. So yeah, yeah. <clears throat> See, sometimes we are nourished by devotees with entirely different perspectives. Yes, that is true. It is. Sometimes you want to go deep within the way we want to go deep within the way we are practicing bhakti. And sometimes you want to go wide in understanding the many different ways in which bhakti can be practiced. So, I, whichever way nourishes us, that is fine. I go for these interfaith conferences and to hear broad-minded Christians, Muslims, Jews, Baha'is talking about their faith. Sometimes they talk about you know, how there are problems in their philosophy and how they address those problems. Uh, various kind of issues, they are very candid. And it's very nourishing to see honest, candid people uh, addressing their faith challenges. But I don't, I, that association may once a year for a few days may nourish me. But I don't want that association throughout the year. So, it, it, we all need different kinds of nourishments. So, we have to find out what our particular need is at a particular time. And so each of us has to learn how we can best nourish ourselves. So, if in the particular way we are practicing bhakti, sometimes we feel, yeah. Oh, I am doing Buddhist division. I know enough about Buddhist division. Let me know about something else more. That's, that's fine. My point when I said is that uh, like-minded doesn't necessarily mean <coughs> exactly that either we all have the same need. It's because in this case, the need itself is sometimes we have a need uh, to go deep into something. Sometimes we have a need to know new things. Oh, okay, what is being done over here? What is being done over there? So it depends. Just whatever narration is, that's good. Okay? Yes, no. So, uh, this different needs which I have talked about. Like, uh, so, initially, like those devotees who are like just joined or just came, for them it is easy, but that eventually, as, as they grow, they should be focusing more on the entire center of Krishna because these things are temporary, and Krishna is permanent. So, isn't it that these needs are initial, eventually you should directly take shelter of Krishna? Yes, but eventually is an elastic term. <laughs> eventually it can be a few years, it can be a few decades, it can be even a few lifetimes. So, you know, we don't know how much distance we have to cover to get to Krishna. So, we, we aspire for pure devotional service, but at the same time, we cannot be unreal. In the sense that, 
we have to be we have to take steps from where we are former so you, you cannot so we cannot uh, suppress ourselves for too long so if uh, we are feeling nourished directly by connection with krishna that's wonderful if not then we nourish ourselves so that we can keep moving toward krishna so i think it's a, it's a little too judgmental and discouraging if we just uh, reduce bhakti to this alone okay if i'm not able to do this then what then i can practice bhakti like this we that's the mood of krishna in 128 to 1212 krishna says just be spontaneously absorbed in me that's 128 if you can't spontaneously absorb then be conscientiously absorbed in me that's 129 if you say you can't be conscientiously absorbed in me then krishna says just work for me even if you can't think of me just work for me then he goes on down and says then at least work for some good cause <coughs> that means get out of yourself start thinking of something bigger than yourself so it's a gradual process and wherever we are from there we keep taking steps forward okay okay yes is it that the philosophical path is the most important mm, yes and no you can support that by saying siddhanta baliya chitte na kare halas iha hai te krishna lage sudrudh manas chatan chatam let's say that don't be lazy about understanding philosophy mm. uh, because through philosophy you can fix your mind on krishna having said that uh, it's not necessary that the path to krishna is limited to one that means some people may just not intrinsically be philosophic but they have deep faith it might be from previous lifetime it might be from this life of upbringing it might be from this life purification and then they just march on toward krishna and they their nourishment doesn't come through philosophy as in especially people who are maybe not so well educated not so intellectual or even people who are very deeply rooted in the tradition they may not feel that need so i for most of us there is a significant amount of philosophical component because we already come from a, a rational way of looking at the world that's how we have been educated so there is a need for rationally understanding philosophy but Uh, again when you say it's a path yeah but you could say the same thing on the that means when you're going by this path you have this need so it's on the each path requires a particular need now if you're going by road then you need a car if you're going by air you need a plane if you're going by waterway you need a boat so each of these are paths and each path has its own set of needs so everybody should have some basic philosophical understanding that's essential and if that those philosophical points one are, one is convinced about i gave this entire series of talks on bhaktivinoda thakur's dashamul tatva and at one level those 10 points are very simple you know vishnu is supreme vishnu is the source of the vedas and the souls are parts of krishna parts of vishnu very simple points but actually those 10 points they succinctly convey some give us philosophy and somebody is convinced about those 10 points one can just move on steadily in the practice of bhakti so there can be many philosophical details which some people which many people might not be interested in so basic philosophical understanding and conviction everyone needs but 
Now, when we talk about philosophy, we often say that philosophy means you're not the body or the soul. But that is like a very basic aspect of philosophy. Now, there is Balde Vidya Bhushan in his uh, Govinda Bhasha commentary goes to pages and pages of analysis of how the Vishaya and the Vishesh are related. Now, you say, what is Vishaya and what is Vishesh? Well, that is Gaudiya Vaishnava philosophy. But most of us, we don't find it so much relevant to our practice. So basic philosophical conviction is definitely required. But intricate philosophical understanding, that may not be needed for everyone. Even in the past, it's the Brahmana who studied philosophy deeply. But all Varnas, people were inclined towards uh, Dharma and Bhakti. Okay? Yes, well, okay, you have the mic. You know, every question you are asking is tough over here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, there's the first point which I'll not address right now. You're saying, if we have confidence in a particular approach, say the push based or the need based, then uh, that confidence can seem like arrogance. How do we maintain humility? And Prabhupada himself was. Uh, at one level, his purpose was clear. But another level, his process was variable. That means when he went to America, he the, the definition of bhakti was get everybody to move into the temple. And a lot of people were doing that. But when Prabhupada came back to India, normally we say that Prabhupada came back victorious and he created like an amazing cultural wave. That's true. But we see that how many of Srila Prabhupada's disciples are actually uh, Indians who became initiated in India. Even though most of his spiritual masters, our spiritual master at the moment were, they were introduced abroad. So, so it's not that in nine, between 1965 and 1970 or 71 72, suddenly India became receptive to Krishna consciousness. Yes, it became but it was more of a, uh, you could say, cultural pride that Krishna consciousness is being practiced all over the world and how wonderful our culture is. Not that I want to practice it the way Prabhupada is teaching it. So, Prabhupada saw that and therefore Prabhupada created the Life Member Program. The Life Member Program is like, you could say, a very, very loose affiliation with Krishna consciousness movement. Where we are people chanting 16 rounds, not practicing four regulated principles and you know, just giving their life to Krishna. And life members is giving one donation and maybe occasionally coming and visiting the temples. But Prabhupada accepted that level of connection also. Now of course Prabhupada wanted it. But from there he, he gave them his books, he gave them the facility to come to the temples and he often went to their houses. He was talking with Manshila Prabhupada disciple. He said that now, Prabhupada must have visited more than 20, 30,000 people's houses when he was in India. Every day he would go to so many people's houses. And I was talking with his one as Giriraj Maharaj. And he said that, you know, Prabhupada, when he would go to life members' houses, he was like very broad. Every, every Hindu, if you their house, they go to, they will have their own altar. And probably they will have uh, various demigods and semigods. <laughs> semi gods is say me God. <laughs> I am God. <laughs> so now Giraj Nath told me I don't remember a single incident when Prabhupada criticized what was there on their altar. Said only Krishna should be there. No, 
न बुद्धि भेदम जनगे न ज्ञानाम कर्म संगीना हो जोशे सर्व कर्माणि इद्वान इत्ता समाच डोंट डिस्टर्ब द माइंड ऑफ इग्नोरेंट पीपल वो आर आल्सो अटैच पर जस्ट एंगेज देम सो दैट दे कैन बी ग्रेजुअली एलिवेट सो द पॉइंट इज दैट सो यू कुड हैव दीज हु आर लाइक फुल टाइम डिवोटीज एंड हियर वी हैव डिवोटी पीपल हु आर जस्ट एप्रिशिएटिव ऑफ कृष्ण कॉन्शियसनेस एंड प्रभुपाद वाज एप्रिशिएटिव ऑफ देम आल्सो and prabhupada engaged many of them who helped in giving contacts and building temples now if you see most of our movement is neither here nor here it's somewhere in between that means we have congregation members who are quite committed but you cannot expect people who have families and jobs to be like full time devotees but they are not like mem- they are not like uh, life members also so prabhupada now was it need based or was it push based both the prabhupada was pushing everyone toward krishna but a somebody from here could not be pushed here then he was ready to accept them over here and then gradually give them a path forward so we also need to do something similar certainly we would want everyone to aspire for and achieve your devotion service but if they are not at that level and it's like sometimes you push people and then we want to push them toward krishna but we end up pushing out them away from krishna isn't it now as preachers we often may count how many people came to krishna or how many people i brought to krishna but there is no count of how many people went away from krishna because of me went away from krishna because of me. it has happened with at least with me with so many people i was in college and after that i i was working in a company and then i used to go Uh, i was to was staying in the kunjvari temple only and i used to go to my company at that time so i used to get into the company bus and two stops afterwards one of the my co students from my college so he was uh, joined the same company so he also get to the bus and during the maybe 45 minutes one hour i would just uh, chant or read or hear something and not talk with anyone because you know, all these are karmis i spend time with them then one day this friend made a made the big mistake of asking me what are you doing <laughs> then in the next 45 minutes i gave her a complete six session bhagavad gita crash course you know existence of god existence of soul law of karma that only krishna is god and chanting of the yoga dharma other devatas are not to be worshiped all the four parts of yoga and i was patting myself on my back you know how how precisely concisely i summarized everything i didn't even notice that his eyes were glazing and then uh, after that every time you know normally a bus has two doors so whenever at his i would get in the bus and then when he would get in the bus he would peep in see where i am sitting and enter from the other door <laughs> <laughs> so just a couple, few years ago i met him in seattle he is married he has children so his sister has become a devotee so that we remember that it's not only i have both of us had a good laugh so that probably his sister undid the damage that i had done <laughs> so he is practicing bhakti now so uh, at some level he is practicing so my point is that it's uh, both we want to push people to a higher level definitely but if somebody is not ready to be pushed to a higher level then you don't want to push them away okay you be at this level and that's also one level of connection now we may not want to spend a lot of time and energy on those people that's okay so uh what about confidence about what we are doing and whether it leads to arrogance i think arrogance comes when we start thinking that our way of practicing or sharing bhakti is the only way or even necessarily the best way if you think okay this is what i feel inspired to do this is what i am going to offer to krishna and to some extent it is good to feel that you know this is the most important thing this is what our movement needs this is what should be done but that doesn't have to come at the expense of minimizing others okay that is not what i feel inspired to do but that is important that is doing it now is that most important i may not feel it important that much that's okay but just because i don't feel it is important doesn't mean it has to be minimized it is said a fanatic 
is one. So there are people hold opinions and opinions hold people. So a fanatic is not one who holds the opinion. A fanatic is one who is held by the opinion. So you know, this, you cannot see anything beyond this at all. Then it becomes a problem. So certainly we all want, are aspiring to ask us go to a pure devotional service and take others also. But uh, each of us will feel inspired to cater to a particular, some of us may feel inspired to cater to a particular need. And that's perfectly fine. Sorry, loudly. Like you mentioned the example of the site, but still, I think that the preaching should be done more to give it to them. Should be, should be. See, it's like uh, should preaching should be done like that, should not be done like that. Don't. We do what we feel inspired to do. And primarily, speak, at least when I write or when I speak, it's like I know that is the time when I am absorbing Krishna. If others are benefited, that's good. We are not. Prabhupada writes in Chaitanya Charita Amrut that one who is writing for Krishna, they should not think they are writing to deliver the world. They are writing to purify themselves. And if while writing to purify yourself, others are benefited, that's good. So, it's a. Uh, there are even in the outside world there are different kinds of people. So there are some people who might be just attracted to us straight. This is what you should do, and move forward in their lives. And that's wonderful. But Krishna's movement is big enough to have different kinds of people attracting different kinds of people. So. It, it, I wouldn't say it has to be done in a liberal way or it has to be done in a strict way. Basically, we all, according to our nature and our situation, find the best way we can serve Krishna. And whatever works for us, whatever works for others, that's good. So, uh, that, I don't think uh, there should be any, that it should be liberal or it should be conservative. It depends. Right? There are liberal people who will do things liberally. And actually speaking, even the most liberal person in his corn is actually more conservative than the most conservative people in other religions. <laughs> so our sadhana is so strict, our four regulative principles. I mean, and I go to the interfaith conferences, and there is no, no other religious practitioner who has, who they follow four regulative principles or they have this kind of sadhana. So, when we are using the word liberal, that's actually a very liberal use of the word liberal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes, um, oh, you have a question? You have a question, bro? Okay, we'll ask. Second mic is there somewhere that can pass on to him. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, coming to Krishna, what actually means of that shelter of Krishna? Because many times shelter in serving, shelter in different things are related to Krishna. So, what actually is the meaning of uh, shelter in Krishna, as you said about the Vaiti? So, is it can be uh, specifically said objectively that you know, we are feeling or some process or anything, any service related to Krishna? What does shelter of Krishna mean? Basically, you don't depend on anything other than Krishna. That means that, okay, if, uh, if I am writing, if I am speaking, if I am doing deity worship, if I am doing counseling, uh, or whatever I am doing, if I feel satisfied just doing that, the results come, it's good. The results don't come, I'm still satisfied. Because, now that could be that, because just I like to do that. Or it could be that, you know, I'm serving Krishna. You see, I talk about the Bhagavad Gita. You know, there are two conclusions to the Bhagavad Gita and they point to two kinds of successes. At one level, Krishna and Arjuna, they have a conversation 
and that conversation is successful in the sense that Krishna persuades Arjuna. Hmm? And Arjuna says, Kareshya Vachanantava. So that is externally successful conversation. Hmm? Now the same message is spoken by Sanjay to Dhritarashtra. But Dhritarashtra still remains attached. So the, whole, the same message that transforms Arjuna does not transform Dhritarashtra. But verses 76 and 77, they describe Rishyami cha mohar maho, Rishyami cha puna puna. So, what is it? Tatsa upam adbhutam. Tatsa samvadam adbhutam. That he is remembering the message and he is remembering the form. So, just by speaking about Krishna, irrespective of the result of speaking about Krishna, he is satisfied. Because he is experiencing Krishna over there. So, basically, uh, if we are not dependent on the results of our service to Krishna for our of course we want the results no doubt you know, because we are serving Krishna in this world and um, uh, we want to serve Krishna in this world so we would like to offer some results to Krishna but if we are not dependent on them then that is uh, that is also at one level we are that means we are satisfied in Krishna. Now of course you could say that we are, we, if you are not even doing our service at all, you think I am satisfied. Well, that is not proper. <laughs> I am detached from the results and I am detached from the service also. <laughs> then we are in Tamoguna. When I am doing this travelling kind of outreach, so I asked his own Radhan Maharaj once. Maharaj, how do we evaluate the success of traveling preaching? If we are at a particular place, we may see the project growing and people coming. So, first thing Maharaj said is, don't even try to evaluate. I was a little taken aback. Then probably Maharaj saw that I was taken aback. Maharaj said, there is just pilot team. If you are invited again to come, that is a success. <laughs> <laughs> then, then he said that if uh, the organizers organize bigger programs for you in the future, that's also bigger success. Then he said that if people start connecting with you specifically or people seek channels to connect with you or you get to know that people are connecting more with Krishna because of you. And that's another level of success. But in India, it happens uh, uh, much faster. The preaching in uh, the West um, is like, uh, what is the word? It is like eating dry chapati on a golden plate. <laughs> it is, not to minimize the Western scenario, but it is People are not, so not so many people, uh, not so many big programs. So it's small, small, it's, it happens very gradually. So there's a glamour, oh, somebody's going to America or whatever. In India, that is still there. When I first went to America in 2014, I was supposed to go to America in 1998 when I was, I given my GRE. And all my relatives were very upset with me which I didn't go, when I didn't go. In 2015, when I first went to America and came back, they, my relatives who had never called me in the last 18 years, they called me. They said, now your life is successful. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there is a certain amount of glamour associated with it. But actually, relatively speaking, uh, preaching in India is much more uh, fulfilling. Not, okay, in that, it's also fulfilling in the West. If, uh, one is satisfied with very gradual growth. But here we can see more tangible results. So now, the reason I was saying this is that we will have to work at each level according to the particular situation. So there is no need to impose any like one set on everything. Can I answer your question? Not objectively 
Okay, yeah. Uh, is it uh, okay in uh, no? Is it like is it only chanting or is it only hearing or is it only remembering? Is it only deity worship? Uh, no, there are. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says in the Chaitanya Charita that each of these can lead us to perfection. And Bhakti Sahasri has given examples of individuals who perfected themselves by one path itself. So it doesn't have to be necessarily one thing. It can be anything. So if we are content in our practice of bhakti. It's a very lo- uh, very lofty state, but still what Krishna says, Yam Labdva Chaparam Labham Manyate Nadikam Tata Yasmin Tithon Dukhena Guruna We may not come, we are not, we are not at that level, but still we are overall contented with our life. This is what I am doing, this is what I want to do more. Then that is, then that is, we are reasonably sheltered in Krishna. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so we, initially when we joined in the ashram, you know, we see that, uh, uh, initially when we joined yeah. the ashram, we see that, you know, we have uh, our, uh, we surrender to our authorities and we take prayer and then we see that our needs are also fulfilled. But, but eventually it has been observed or, you know, we see that, you know, uh, due to fulfilling our needs, to, uh, of our psychophysical nature, social, philosophical and culture, you know, we start developing in that area and then eventually that surrender is not there, you know, that surrender is not to be seen to, uh, to a, to spiritual, uh, to uh, Krishna's representative or, you know, spiritual master. And then eventually we see that, you know, how we understand that surrender and need both grow together or uh, is it that one grow and other doesn't grow? Okay, so is it that, uh, say when we find a particular niche in our practice of bhakti, where our need is served and then we specialize in that and we start serving others' need over there. So then, afterward, that surrender may not be there. That's a difficult question. I'd say that, uh, it's a... And different devotees will work in different ways to serve Krishna. So, surrender is not necessarily a one-zero thing. It, there could be degrees. And, uh, you know, Prabhu, Tamal Krishna Maharaj was in India. And he was playing a very important role in the Juhu project. But he just found the management unbearable. It was exhausting. And he said, I want to go and preach. And that's also a good example. In India, there was no preaching. Because at that time, the Indians, for them, Prabhupada's Western disciples, they were young. So, they were like, uh, initially curiosity objects. Oh, why, who is this Western person who is like wearing dhoti kurta or sari? And then afterwards, they were more like symbols of their cultural pride. See, our culture is so great, they are practicing. But they were not interested in uh, learning from them. So there was no preaching over there. I was talking with Krishna Chandra Prabhu in Mumbai. He was telling me that initially when Giriraj Maharaj came to his place, no, he first, first Giriraj Maharaj came to you know, give some prasad and basically to make life member. So he said, I actually kept him waiting outside my office for hours and hours. And he says, now I'll wait hours to meet him for something. So things have changed. So initially, they, were, they, just not, they did not value so much. So for him to do preaching, he had to go to America. And at that time, Prabhupada was not very happy because Prabhupada needed him over there. But what to do? He felt strong that he has to go to America. And actually for him also it was a challenge. Because generally speaking, okay, Mm. See, there is um, there is facility and there is freedom. In general, in our movement, we will not get both together. If you want freedom, freedom means, okay, this is how I want to preach, this is how I want to serve, this is what I want to do. Then, you will not get the facility. Why? Because those who are the current leaders of the movement, they will have a particular vision of how to use the resources that they have. So, if you need the freedom, then you cannot demand facilities. 
then if we can get the freedom, but we have to create the facilities for us. That's why Tamal Krishna Maharaj went to America. He said, I want to go to America. Prabhupada did not appoint him as a GBC for America. So when he went there, here he was like one of the top leaders. And there he was a, like a visiting sannyasi. And he went to one temple and another temple and he gave a few classes. And then he didn't know what to do. Then he had this, by Krishna's mercy, the brainwave. What was that? The bus party. Radharam was a bus party. And that stunning preaching happened over there. So he created that facility. Now Prabhupada did not reject him because of that. Prabhupada was happy. He was doing preaching and Prabhupada saw that he was also making the devotees. Prabhupada was very happy with that. So, then he said, Tamal Krishna Mahal not surrender. No, Prabhupada, you can't say like that. He was a very great soul. But at that particular point, that's the way he wanted to serve and Prabhupada accommodated that. So, I'm not uh, recommending rebellion over here because See, generally, if we have, if we have uh, facility, we can't have freedom. If we have freedom, we can't have facilities. And usually, wherever we are, the grass seems greener on the other side. So, if we have facilities but no freedom, then feel, oh, I don't have freedom, I don't have freedom, I don't have freedom. I can't do this, I can't do that. But then you have freedom and then you realize, that I have no facilities. What am I doing? What am I going to do? So it's 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 a it's a choice. So now, if some devotees need uh, more freedom, then they cannot demand facilities. And then they may use that freedom. And now, how they use it is up to them. Sometimes they may use the freedom. Sometimes they may abuse the freedom. We don't know. Uh, so is it that those who want freedom are not surrendered? I wouldn't say surrender is one zero. It is. Uh, like Indra Maharaj, he negotiated with the spiritual master, Narada Muni. Indra said that, Narada Muni said, just tolerate, you know, honor, dishonor. Actually, Narada Muni tried to checkmate him. He said, you are a, a small child and children don't take honor, dishonor so seriously. Sometimes children, they fight and they quarrel and they say, cut me. I will never talk with you. And next day they are playing together. The children don't take honor dishonor so seriously. And he says, if you are not a children, if you are spiritual, if you are adult, you are mature, then mature people don't take honor dishonor seriously. They are transcendental. Then he is again, both ways he sort of caught him. But Dhru Maharaj had his need and he got it addressed. So he said that, he said that, I, what you are saying is true, but I can't apply this. Then his spiritual master accommodated him at that place, the way he could. So, if we find a niche in which we can serve Krishna, then uh, if, we, if that's how we want to serve Krishna, it's not necessary that it's a lack of surrender. It's just that we need a particular space, a particular amount of freedom. But then don't demand facilities. And don't complain for not getting facilities. If we want to do something, then we have to, if we want to do something in a new way, then we may have to take the resources, we may have to create the resources for us. That's the challenge. Prabhupada's God brothers told him that you come and work under us and then we will give you sannyas. And then we will send you on our behalf to America. Whether that would happen or not happen, Prabhupada knew. Prabhupada said, I myself go. It was a challenge. So, surrender is not necessarily one zero. Ultimately, I think every, I've talked with many spiritual masters also when I travel abroad and I See, in India, the overall mode of instruction is vertical. The authority gives instructions. But in America, it's more horizontal. You know, spiritual master disciples sit on the same table and we take food together. I can't imagine that. But when I went to Chicago, I was with Maharaj. So he would have told me that, no, you take lunch with Maharaj. I said, I cannot do that. He said, no, Maharaj wants that. He said, no, no, I'll just talk with Maharaj. And then Maharaj said that, Radha Maharaj, he said that, uh, you know, he said, you know, I feel uncomfortable taking food when you are not taking food. I didn't know what to say after. <laughs> I just, I took it that time. So, you know, the things are different in different places. So, you know, why I am making this point is that, I talk with one very senior Prabhupada disciple, who is also a quite a well-known spiritual master. He told me that I am happy 
if my disciple is happily engaged. So whether they are doing exactly what I am telling them to do, or they are doing something which they feel inspired. If they are happily engaged, then that is good. So it's a it's a complicated uh, when it comes to specific applications, it's a complicated question, and, and we'll have to carefully. We don't want to, in the name of freedom, just go into illusion. Because freedom brings a lot of responsibility with it. And uh, see, the lesser the structure in our life, the greater the rupture the mind can cause in our life. The lesser the structure in our life. That means, say, if I wake up in the morning and I have my whole day, maybe I'll read Bhagavatam, maybe I will... Uh, Maybe I will hey, counsel this devotee. Maybe I will do this. I have no obligatory thing to do. And the mind will say, you know, I just sleep a little bit. Or maybe, you know, surf the net to find some interesting news. We do this, do that. And sometimes we spend hours in that. So, it's, we all need a structure in our life. So, it requires a lot of... Uh, Maturity to be able to create one's own structure for one's own life. It's not that easy. So don't treat surrender as a like a one zero thing. But you have to gradually find how best we can serve Krishna. And if you specialize in a particular field, then it is good to find out some senior devotee who is specialized in that field or at least who understands that field well. And then take their guidance about how we can work in that field. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes, where is the mic? Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful class to you. In the film, we are talking about striking a balance between being a lenient and liberal and being conservative. So, in that reference, we gave an example of Sri Prabhupada who very nicely tried to balance the day when he went to the house of life and they never criticized the Devagar worship. I see your example also when you were going abroad to the interfaith for the Dharma Sahaja. I find a very wonderful balance. It requires some kind of maturity to you. In my life, I really end up in being a problem in that. So, can you please guide me in this sense like how we should develop that maturity to strike a perfect balance? In between being liberal and being conservative, because we don't want to dilute our principles. Yeah. So, how do we strike a perfect balance? Well, nothing is perfect in life. So, <laughs> we all learn by experience. <coughs> and sometimes uh, we err on the side of uh, maybe we are too strict, and sometimes we err on the side of being too lenient. So, life doesn't come with a guarantee of right decisions. Sometimes we make the right decisions and sometimes we make the decisions right. <laughs> okay, I took this decision. What do I do after that? So I, I had to make it right. I was traveling with a group of western people or westernized Indians, you could say. And I have my bottle of water and I drank some water one bottle. And usually I touch my mouth to it. So they ask, can I have some water? I said, no, I have touched my mouth. So what? I'm thirsty. <laughs> 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 so he says, no, no, no. No, but you know, I cannot give this water. It is, you know, there's not even an English word for juta. <laughs> <laughs> so, then I said, no, you know, in our culture, if you have touched the mouth to some water, we cannot give it to others. You mean if I will be dying of thirst, you will not give me water? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, after that, that person had went and complained to the devotee who had organized my program. You know, he talks so much about care and he doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> so, then I was talking with the devotee and he said, you know, he told me you should have given water. I said, really? I, I didn't even, I think you, you can't do that. He says, you know, you cannot, if they're going to feel so offended, what is more important? 
I don't, I don't know. I honestly don't know whether I'll be able to do it again. <laughs> Maybe if I'm traveling with Western people, I'll drink water from above. <laughs> <laughs> so there is uh, um, there is no <coughs> there is no perfect balance, but I think we all have to learn from sometimes with our intelligence, sometimes with our experience. It's like if you say that you are going uh, on a thin mountain path, and the mountain path is winding. It's a winding mountain path. So you could say one side is a liberal, one side is a conservative. So now, you, you can't see the full path. It's like, if the path is winding this way, then you have to go this way. The path is winding that way, you have to go that way. So, how do we know? It's like, uh, in life, sometimes uh, things need to be kept as they are, sometimes things need to be changed. Giriraj Maharaj told me about how, how careful Prabhupada was about not offending people. Um, when he entered life member to some devotee's house, and you know, some devotees had, uh, the, the people had cooked food with onion and garlic. And then Prabhupada, the devotees said, Prabhupada, there is onion garlic in this. And Prabhupada said, there is no onion garlic in this. And then Prabhupada said, no, he said, he picked up onion garlic. So this is onion garlic. Prabhupada said, there is no onion garlic in this. He was bewildered. And he actually brought it to Prabhupada. Say, Prabhupada. <laughs> Prabhupada looked at it. There is no onion garlic in this. <laughs> Prabhupada and all the devotees took that prasad. That, that food. And then, Prabhupada, after that, he went back and told uh, that you know, Prabhupada said, for an, an Indian house, if a sadhu comes to your house and then rejects the food and goes, that is considered to be like a disaster. So, he said that it is our mistake, we did not tell them that we don't take onion garlic. We didn't emphasize it adequately. So, then the, this Prabhupada was telling me that actually, when Prabhupada heard this, then I understood that becoming Krishna conscious is the adventure. <laughs> It's not just do this, don't do this. No, it is how to be Krishna conscious in various situations. It's an adventure. Now again, I might be giving examples which might seem to go toward the liberal, but I'm not saying that we have to be liberal. I'm just saying that uh, there are times when uh, there are times when um, we need to learn from experience what is right, what is wrong. Now I went to a temple and there the temple president is a Mataji. And she herself came to pick me up. And there was no one else in the car. And I was a little apprehensive. And she's of course old, she's 60, 65. And because no one was there, she is, I told Mataji, you yourself came for picking me up. You must be very busy. So actually everyone else is busy, I am free. Yes. I said, really? I said, what do you mean? Because she said that actually everybody has fixed services, my schedule is variable. And I also want to talk with you. And then, so she drove me and then, so they, they are both, uh, her husband is also a senior devotee. And the next day there was another program. And she said, I will drive you to the program. And then she drove me to the program and I came back. It was a long drive, one hour or something like that. And then after that, two, three days, then her husband, we, are, we know, he's a very senior devotee, but we know each other. So, he went and he, was, he looked at me and he smiled. He said, I'm surprised. You are wandering around town with my wife. <laughs> oh God. I said, bro, you know, I expressed to her and she said, you know, she is the only person who is free and others are not free and I thought that she knows the logistics over here and Gaurang Prabhu had told me for the first time when he had gone to America, he had gone to meet Rompad Maharaj and Rompad Maharaj, the person who had come to pick him up was the Mataji. So, yeah, so I thought that, so he said that, yes, now she likes you, she, she likes you, so she will talk about this and outreach and everything. He said, but at least you should express your reservation. He said, uh, so I said, Prabhu, I didn't want to inconvenience devotees. He said, no, but he said, in this case, you should express your reservation. 
So now, I thought I was being, I was just, uh, uh, I was trying not to be inconvenience. But then sometimes, that can be a matter of criticism. So then I talked with Radha Maharaj about this. So he said that, you know, you should, uh, you should not do that. And he said, if you are going to do that, if you are tall, you have to do that. You know, before you start the drive, call someone. And tell them, you know, that I am going on this drive, this is the situation, what should I do? And they say yes, then tell them that we will reach in about half an hour, 45 minutes. And then, after you reach them, tell them that we have reached here. So basically it's like, somebody has a track of you. So of course that's unavoidable situation. I try to avoid it as much as possible. So, you know, sometimes we may be, we may be liberal and people may expect us to be conservative. Sometimes we may be conservative, people may expect us to be liberal. And there is no perfect balance to this. We have to feel our way forward. We have to feel our way forward and move on in life. And um, so I think it's more that uh, if our purpose is to serve Krishna, then even if we do something wrong, Krishna will tell us that either through we will ourselves realize it, something will go wrong, or somebody will point it out to us. Maybe you're stretching too much over here. Maybe you're being too hard, too tight over here. So. I think it's it's a matter of gradually through experience, intelligence and interaction. These are intelligence, we get some experience and we interact with others. Then we learn. Okay. Yes, please. I have a question. I just want to know your future style in Western countries because I Sorry, sorry. I got carried away. Yeah. Which is interesting is, what is the country's style? For example, let's say you're talking to somebody, and these are words that you know, expressed its, uh, say, offenses, its the hatred. People do not have any idea what it's called tolerance. So what is the direction of how to approach? Okay. Are you trying to go to the West? <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> Maybe I was a little, I was a little too blunt. I asked Niranjan Maharaj this question. So you know, because in Ukraine the preaching is going on very big. So I asked Maharaj, you know, how do how do people take up Krishna consciousness so so much in uh, Ukraine? What is the psychology? Maharaj asked me, do you spend a lot of time in Ukraine? Should I have not been even once to Ukraine? And Maharaj knows it, <laughs> because he is the GPC over there. But he is very polite. So I would say that, I will not go into much into details, but uh, there are four broad, uh, you could say, indicators of the rise of Sattva in the western world and India has also become westernized and those are broadly the channels for us to reach western people otherwise we appear too religious, too exclusivist uh, too, too religious, too sectarian and too otherworldly too religious means we have our own dress and, and uh, we just appear too exclusivist this is your only way and too otherworldly you just don't care about this world, you only care about going back to God. So because of that, and these are three broad reasons, there could be many more, we don't seem to connect with people, especially Western people. But those four broad things are and mindfulness, environmentalism, yoga, <coughs> and veganism. So, you know, people are very troubled by the mind and Buddhist mindfulness is very big. Yoga is also very big. Many people are, many, many people are becoming vegans now. Vegans. And uh, many people are in, just in environmentalists. So, Govardhan Eco Village is actually providing, there is yoga, there is uh, environmentalism, is the big thing over there. And they are working on something for mindfulness now. So, my primary thrust among these four is on mindfulness. So, you tell people you are not the body, they feel it too abstract. So, what's like the simple appearances? What's like if you use it, what is there? Is 
So yeah, that is something which can be adapted. It's not so much what words you use, but what topics you focus on. So we have a lot of access to new types of words because sometimes it really becomes very really offensive actually. Uh, like, you know, yeah. Yeah, Devam Maharaj told me that he prefers the word infinite consciousness to God. He even doesn't use the word soul, he uses the word consciousness. Bhakti Maharaj Maharaj told me that he is quite a humorous person. It is sinful to use the word sinful in Western preaching. <laughs> it will alienate people. So, yeah, sinful, hell, bona fide, malafide, that kind of things. You know, it's, it's a little... People need to be persuaded rather than uh, convinced. So it's a subtle difference. It's like, this is the right thing? No, just tell me how this works. So, then I'll take it up. It's like that. So we have to find out what their need is. So I was talking about mindfulness. So I was saying that you tell people you are not the body, they are not interested. But you tell people you are not your mind. And they are very interested. Because the mind troubles everyone. And if they understand they are not the mind, they are also understanding they are not the body. Isn't it? <laughs> So, we have to, like I told about Christians rebranding God, from not as a cosmic supplier, but as a cosmic therapist. So, like that, we have to adjust a few things. Okay. Thank you. Okay. What, Antari, to what, what time should we stop? Yeah, you can use Krishna, but the way you present Krishna, I present Krishna not as a, not as God, but as the object of loving yogic meditation. <laughs> so people are interested in yoga, people are very interested in love, people are interested in meditation. So, so the word God is just, there was a, at the interfaith conference, there was a Christian pastor, who they had done some survey among American youth. What is your conception of a pastor? Or of a pastor or a priest, a Protestant or Christian, depending on whatever, post Protestant or Catholics. So there's one youth, one young boy, he said, a priest is someone who is constantly worried that someone, somewhere, is having some fun. <laughs> so, their conception is that that religious people are just stopping us in our enjoyment. So, so then, you know, we have to, we have to make sure that we don't run into those roadblocks. So, I think it's uh, gradually, if somebody connects with us, they will realize that we are personalists. Is it that in the first, uh, first interaction itself, we have to give them the, give them the full thing? Not necessarily. It, it, it doesn't seem to work. People will gradually take it up. And if it, uh, if it doesn't, if it hits some sore spots, then they will never come back. So we have to be careful. We, we are going to talk about Krishna. But how we talk about it, that's important. Yes, for Okay. Okay. You give the mind behind.
मेरी फैमिली भाई के वगैरह पेशे में भी मेरे भाई को मिल गया और फिर हम शुरू लेके दुर्गा सिंह क्या कर रहे हैं इस पेशेंट साल में दुर्गा लोग का साल में लेकिन क्या मैं इस साल में दुर्गा सिंह मौजूद हैं या तो हाउ इज इट दैट लाइक वी आर टुडे और इट्स नॉट दैट मच पेशेंट दिस कैन ट्राउल इस पेशेंट Yes. So, how are we to go ahead? I guess this marriage is going to increase more and more. Okay. So, Prabhupada, when he went to the West, he preached very strongly. But now, devotees in the West are preaching very mildly, you could say. And now, in India also, many devotees are maybe adopting that, and westernization is coming. So, how will we go on? <coughs> Everything depends on not everything, but you know, when we preach, a lot is dependent on the situation. Strategy is determined by the situation. You know, in the, I think, 1920s, 1930s, India was the world hockey champion. And nobody could compete with India. But then that time, hockey was played on grass. And then, they changed to astroturf. And hockey, hockey, it was more like, in grass, it was more like a skill. But as to turf, it was all muscles. So Indians didn't train for muscles. And then India is no is not longer in the top in the hockey now. So so now we say Prabhupada feels strong in the West. But then that's the Prabhupada when he came to India, what did he do? He he as I said he accommodated life members. Was he strong? Yes, he was strong. But he did not reject them if they were not ready to commit themselves as initiated devotees. He gave them a place through life membership. So, the 1960s were an extraordinary time in American history where people were already rebellious. They had already rejected. So, I, I talk actually a lot with, elaborately with Nomaz Vanhag Maharaj about this. I, I asked Maharaj, Mar, what was. What was your vision for starting over the Nico village? So Maharaj first said, I am not a very organized person. But after Maharaj, after that Maharaj gave an elaborate answer. Maharaj said that when Prabhupada went to America, at that time, the hippie generation had already rejected mainstream culture. And he rejected mainstream religion, mainstream education, mainstream uh, um, relationship kind of thing. Everything they had rejected. And Prabhupada, give them philosophical foundation for their rejection. So they were already in the mood of rejecting. Like in the lecture, Prabhupada says, the hippies had already done Sarva Dharma and I taught them, Maam Ekam Sharanam <laughs> So, <clears throat> but when Prabhupada came to India, he said that India at that time, uh, the mood was of cultural nationalism. That India had been subordinated by foreign rule for thousands, for several hundred years, and Britishers had ruled us. And now, those same Western people who had ruled us are taking our practice, culture. And Prabhupada tapped into that mode of cultural nationalism. And what did Prabhupada, Prabhupada made the life membership program, and he made it like a prestigious thing. I met one person in Canada, and he told me that his father was a ISKCON life member, and not only was a ISKCON life member, Actually, on his office name plate, he had put ISKCON life member like a degree. <laughs> so, it, it had become, ISKCON had such a prestigious organization at that time, that being a life member of ISKCON was a prestigious thing. So, Prabhupada accepted them also at that level. So, was Prabhupada not preaching strongly? Say, I'm a little, uh, uh, I said, Prabhupada was effective. So, whatever was required, he did that. There are... <coughs> Prabhupada was... Uh, I think, I don't know exact event now. Uh, one devotee told me, I have asked Kiriraj Maharaj, Kiriraj Maharaj told me he will find out the exact reference, but he also... See, Prabhupada was in Mexico or somewhere in South America, and they asked the national television, they said, uh, they had like 5 seconds or 10 seconds. What message would you like to give to? What would you like to speak to Mexico? So, 
Prabhupada, like, he spoke about something very general, he said. Uh, I, I pray that God's blessings come on Mexico, something like that. This, in 5, 10, 15 seconds, what can you, what can you preach? So Prabhupada just acted as a saintly person, invoking God's blessings. Now, Prabhupada obviously would not do that all the time, definitely not. But he did that at that time. So we have to see what is effective. So then Maharaj told me that because there is uh, religious violence, so much violence in the name of religion. Huh. But I wrote a book on the Ramayana and it has got into some national book award. It is in the final stages now. So they had an interview. They, so in that interview, the first question was that Ram has become very politicized. And can violence be justified in the name of religion in any situation? So, there's one question, he says, uh, is the Ramayana an attack, depicting an attack by North Indians or South Indians? <laughs> it's crazy. So there's what, I was at this Ramayana conference, Ramayana like convocation, so there's one person, he said, I am from the RPC. What is the RPC? This Ravan Protection Committee. <laughs> So they say Ravan was a Dravidian and Ram was an Aryan. And his Aryans have spoiled the good name of the Dravidians. So we have to redeem the good name of Ravan. And it's, 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 uh, it's strange. So the point, I, I'm, I'm not going to go into too much tangent over it. The point I'm making is that we have to find out what is effective. And to find out what is effective, we have to know what are the sore spots of people. So we are growing enormously. India is the powerhouse of is gone right now in terms of temple, number of temples, number of devotees, number of books distributed. It's huge. It's uh, extraordinary. It's, especially if you go to the West and come back and see the preaching in India, it's very encouraging to see that. <coughs> but yeah, Westernization is happening and we will have to find out what works the best. There will always be devotees who will be giving the direct Krishna consciousness and there will be my, people who will be attracted to that. But there will be others who may have to do other things. And they will attract people in different ways. It's, the challenge will be that if, if A, B, C, somebody, somebody does something, uh, somebody does, say somebody gives a class without speaking about Krishna. Now when I go in Intel and places like that, I can't speak about Krishna. I can mention God, I can mention infinite consciousness. I was talking with... Uh, who is the Maharaj with three PhDs? Not Krishna Ketra Maharaj. Hanuvat Prishak Maharaj. Hanuvat Prishak Maharaj. So Hanuvat Prishak Maharaj was invited to a conference and he was invited to give a call-in lecture. And it was about consciousness. So then after that somebody, so somehow the professor had invited him and then that, that talk became so interesting that his HOD came. And then the dean came. And the principal, everybody came. And then that professor came and told him, you know, if something goes wrong, uh -huh. if you speak something wrong, then I'll be ruined now. So I said, don't worry. And then, you know, when I had gone, when I started going to the West, Radha Maharaj had told me one thing that, when you answer questions, be very careful of planted questions. Planted questions means somebody asks a question to get you into trouble. So, they want to give you a answer. Now, a typical example of a planted question is, have you, like you ask a man, a husband, have you stopped beating your wife? Have you stopped beating your wife? If you say yes, that means you were beating your wife before. If you say no, what a shameless guy, you are still beating your wife. So, you can't answer the question, you have to question the question. So, anyway, that's an example of planted question. So, so, this, so somebody asked him, or Maharaj, so, so, Swami, what is your religion? So, now he could say that, you know, I could see that professor who had invited me become so tense. And everybody looking at him. So, Maharaj said that, I told him that, no, I, I, I may have my religion, you may have your religion. Now, here, I have come to talk about consciousness. So if you have any question or consciousness, you can ask. If you want to know about my religion, after the class, we can meet prayer person and we can talk. 
So, if somebody is giving us a podium, uh, somebody else is giving us a forum to speak, then in their forum, we need to speak what is acceptable within their parameters. But if we start speaking that in our parameter, our polymers. So, if I come to a temple in a Bhagavatam class, I don't use the word Krishna. And I start using the word infinite consciousness. I will get into infinite trouble. <laughs> so, if somebody else is giving us some forum, we have to follow the parameters of that forum. We cannot, <coughs> several of my books have been published by mainstream publishers. So, one I was talking with my literary agent, he told me that no publisher will want to, no mainstream publisher will want to act as a propaganda tool for an organization. So, he said that if you give wisdom and you say that you are affiliated with this organization, it's not a problem. But if you mention that organization and promote that organization, then no publisher will publish your book. Because they don't want, if you want to promote your organization, use your organization's forums for that. If you are going to some other forum, then you have to deliver what they expect you to deliver. Now, of course, now what they expect us to deliver, if it has, if it has zero intersection with what we want to do, what we want to deliver, then there is no point in going there. But, if there is some intersection, then we have to stay within that intersection. So I think within our temples, we should make sure, very sure that we just give direct Krishna consciousness. And depending on where we are, we might have to use certain, uh, partic for particular audiences, we might have to use particular things. But if in our temples itself we start giving sort of <coughs> vague wishy washy, not wishy washy, the vague sort of things, then it will be a problem. Okay? So, thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhatta Vrinda ki, Mithai Gaur Premanandi.